there. This is Dr. Barlett, and this is an introduction to microbiology. So let's talk a little bit about microbiology. So first of all, what are microorganisms? Because this is what we study in microbiology. The key concept of microorganisms, of course, is that they are micro, very small, and organisms, generally living creatures. So we are talking about the absolute tiniest living creatures that are out there. Most of the time, you can't see them with your eyes at all. Some of them can get to be a little bit bigger, and we'll talk about those. We also, like I said, are talking about things that are living organisms most of the time, and then a few things that fall on sort of a boundary line. But that's what's going to be important. All right, so now that we're talking about microorganisms, why do we care about them? What are the things in our lives that relate to microorganisms? Now, you probably know of some, and you might not know of others. I'm not gonna comprehensively cover all of the options, but let me tell you about a few. So the one that most people think of right away, of course, is disease. Microorganisms get into humans and other living creatures that are multicellular, and they cause problems such as disease by using and messing with our cells and our systems. So. Clearly, diseases are an issue, and if you have been following any portion of recent news, you might recognize that this is a generalized coronavirus, which causes a number of diseases in humans. However, microorganisms also do a number of things that can be really useful for us. For example, we use microorganisms for fermentation. This is one of the oldest human uses of microorganisms before people even knew what bacteria were. They knew that if you mix certain foods and left them in certain places, they would change over time. And so for instance, fresh milk sits in a place with some bacteria, they eat up the sugars in it and turn it into yogurt. We also use fermentation for things such as sauerkraut, soy sauce, and numerous alcoholic beverages, and we'll spend some time on fermentation this semester. Microorganisms are also extremely important in ecology and the environment around you. So less than 1% of all microorganisms in fact cause disease. The majority are simply living in the world and have no particular interest in you or anything else that is disease causing. So. My background is actually in microbial ecology and specifically the microbial ecology of streams and wetlands. So the bacteria that live in water sources, they help do things like break down leaves and keep the cycles of nature going. And of course, one more key microorganism location is in and on us. Our microbiome, or the microorganisms that play a key role in our bodies, are actually really important. In fact, if you count up all the cells that make up a human body, and then count up all the cells that are just bacteria and other microorganisms that are within and on us, there are 10 times more of them, of the microorganisms, than there are of us. Now, our cells are bigger, but there's still a lot more of them, and we can't function without them. The ones that live in our guts literally play a role in the process of breaking down our foods and providing nutrients and other things that we need. So if you grow up in a bubble with no microorganisms, you would actually die. So all of these things are key parts of microbiology. Okay, but here's the problem, of course, is microorganisms are very tiny so tiny we can't see them. So how do you study what you cannot see? So a big part of microbiology comes from the idea that historically people had to figure this out on their own. Like I said, fermentation makes sense, but they didn't understand what was in there and what was doing that process. A lot of microbiology is putting together the pieces of a puzzle that you only have parts of. We can't just dive in and count the bacteria many times. We have to find ways to connect what we can see and count to what we can't. For many hundreds and thousands of years, we literally were unable to spot any version of a microorganism and had to do a lot of sort of interesting thinking. And when we get into cells, we'll talk more about this. And then eventually people did invent microscopes. 
The original microscopes were super interesting. They had a couple of lenses and were focused on single specimens and people could barely see them. And they'd find, for example, little things swimming in water and be like, what are the little beasties in this water? But now we know what a lot of those little beasties are. And that has really come full circle in our understanding of microbiology. So as we learn this subject, keep an eye out for things that were, hey, that was very hard to see or understand. And here's how we were able to learn about it over time and how things have changed over time since we now have better microscopes, better techniques and better capabilities. All right. So what is microbiology going to be all about? Really, microbiology is about a number of things, and all of it is focused on the microorganisms. But there are some key concepts that come back throughout this class in different places. A big concept is the categorization and organization of microorganisms. We want to know how they are different, what types of groups they fall into, and what's similar about them. This allows us to do things like work with them, or in the cases of disease, work against them better. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about different groups of microorganisms, how they are connected, how they are different from each other, and being able to take that information and organize it will be important. We wanna know about their structure, the physical structures that make up these very tiny creatures, and we wanna know about their functions. So we wanna know what they can do with those structures and how they relate to the world around them. The other concepts that we're gonna cover in this class really involve some of those other ideas related to microbiology, such as being able to understand how you can study something you can't see, which involves things such as critical thinking and drawing distinct conclusions from data that isn't always precise. So we want to be able to use our brains and say, hey, this makes sense, this doesn't. I can draw a connection between these things, I can see the logic of how these connect, and being able to take that information and apply it to a new situation. Disease microorganisms are changing all the time. Being able to say, well, I recognize what this one did. Let me see how it interacts here or how this drug interacts with a different microorganism is an important part of working with microbiology. So keep all of these in mind as we go forward. So starting, of course, with the categorization and organization of microbiology, this has been an issue since they're so tiny that they're very hard to see. So early organization in microbiology tended to rely very strongly upon our visualization. So we could put some of these guys under microscopes. We can stain them in different ways. And this is something we'll talk about in lab and try to see how they look different. But so many of them look the same. And then as we got better at what we were doing, we got more tools and techniques. We could dive in a little deeper. We could see better structures. So we've changed the way we organized. And then even further, because visualization has really proven to be insufficient for microbes, we've now dove into the DNA to say, hey, how do these things relate? All right, so let's take a step back in time and think about how biologists organized their world. The earliest earliest microscopic types of classifications relied on things that were much, much bigger than microorganisms. In this case, plants and animals. We could tell the differences between a plant and an animal. Plants were green things that stood still. Animals were not green things that moved around. And there were other things that related to that. And so we sort of started with this idea of, well, there's a whole lot of plants and there's a whole lot of animals, but we're not really sure how everything else might fit in or what else might be there. As the tools got better, we discovered smaller things that didn't really fit into these categories of plant or animal. And so you end up with groups such as protists and fungi. So protists are typically single-celled creatures. So they didn't really fit quite right with plants or animals. Some of them were green, some of them were not. Some of them moved, some of them did not. And sometimes the green ones moved and that's where we started having to create new classifications. Fungi were another one that just didn't look the same as these first two. So as you read about the organization of microbiology, you'll see that it changed a lot over time. 
And while I'm not expecting you to memorize all of those changes, understanding why things had to change and what we used to classify groups in different points in time and in different ways are very important. So these are two of the groups that we will be studying a little more in depth in the future. More fungi than protists because fungi cause more disease and this class is still pretty focused on disease. But then we still had to get further because these are still very large things in a comparative sense. And as our equipment got better, we were able to see smaller things. So this image is of cheek cells. So like the cells literally on the insides of your cheeks. And you can see that the cheek cells are very large and that there are little tiny bacteria that are very, very small and they look different. So the cheek cells have all these structures. They stain in such a way. So they have an outside edge and this inside little piece. And that would be what we called a nucleus. And these other very tiny things, they didn't have all these structures. We couldn't see anything inside of them. So we started giving these things new classifications. We said, well, everything that has a little kernel inside of it, we call a eukaryote. U stands for true. Carry stands for literally kernel, which is our nucleus. And so eukaryotes typically are large cells with a nucleus. And then we said, well, these other ones, they don't have this thing. They must have been from earlier, which is, again, using our critical thinking to say, well, a nucleus is more complex, so it must have developed later. We'll call these pro for before karyotes, so pre-nucleus essentially. And so now we had two classifications of more groups. But as we continue to dive in, it turns out things were even more different. We learned about another thing that were similar. So bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotes. They are both small cells with no nuclei. But it turns out that they're different in how they're structured and where they live. So now we had to get more complex in our understanding. And this is where we get into the DNA, because once we could extract DNA and actually look at the changes over time, which takes even more critical thinking, we can put the pieces together in a whole different way. And so Carl Wosey is the person who really got into the DNA and created the phylogenetics, that's our branching tree of life that tells us how it all relates. And you can see bacteria all work together on their own. They have more similarities than differences. Archaea also have more similarities than differences. Although interestingly enough, from a DNA perspective, they're very similar to the eukaryotes. When we get into cells, we'll talk more about this later. But when you got into the DNA, you learned that the visual of them was insufficient to understand them. So when you learn about bacteria and archaea and other creatures, you'll find out that there's different ways we examine them. So how can we tell bacteria apart? Well, we typically do start with the same methods we used to use, which is, hey, how do they look? So we're gonna learn a lot about their shape and size. This one here is a spirochete. We examine how they grow because they grow in clusters and they look different. So they'll have different ways of growing, different colors, different edges. We still use some of that to tell them apart. And other things we're gonna do, especially in the lab, include telling them apart by seeing how they function. It's not just their structures, but their function, as in if they work in these tubes that have different substances, how do they change the environment around them? So these are all ways that we're going to examine our bacteria. So why do we care? What's the point of microbiology anyway? Well, microbiology, as I pointed out, is all around you in many ways and on and part of you, and it's not going anywhere. And so, why do we care? Well, if we can learn more about how microbiology works, that means we can work better with the microbiology or in the cases that we need to against it, learn better how our immune system interacts with the microbiology, learn better how to control microbial growth if we need to stop it in some cases, and how to control it when we want it to work for us. It's in that bottom picture that's a part of the process of making beer with yeasts. So sometimes we want to harness the power of the microorganisms. So all of those things are important to us and we will cover all of them as aspects of this class. So I hope that taught you a little something about the basics of microbiology that you're excited to learn more.